So uh, I will just start. Baby, baby. Yes. Okay. Buenos dias. Gracias por su asistencia. Good morning. Thank you for coming to this series of conferences, New Data and Methods for Generating Official Information. Today we have two very interesting speakers, but let me first give the floor to Dr. Julio Santaella, which is the president of INEGI. Please, Dr. Santaella. Thank you, uh, Ricardo. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a pleasure to be with, with uh, you today. Uh, first thing is that I would like to thank uh, Tecne Monterrey for this uh, collaboration uh, with INEGI in organizing these six uh, virtual conferences during the month of November. Uh, special thanks to um, uh, close friends and previous colleagues, Alejandro Poiré, Carlos Lever, and uh, Hugo Fuentes, which, uh, whom I see in, in the screen today. Uh, they have uh, made a nice effort um, to organize and have a great series of seminars. I also like to, to thank and say hello to all the speakers. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience and your knowledge with us. Um, let me just remark that these conferences are an opportunity to look at the state of the art in generation of information uh, with a particular emphasis of uh, using new data sources and new innovative methodologies. Um, as you may recall, the general objective of the conference series was to review the possibilities of accessing and exploiting these new uh, data sources uh, with very clear and specific purposes. Uh, and also the, the idea was to generate uh, information that would be of interest to public policies or public decisions on social and economic matters. Uh, some of these uh, data uh, we recognize and classify as being available in private information repositories or uh, residing in public or government entities. So that's part of the heterogeneity that we're looking at. Uh, during these uh, conferences, we also reviewed the state of the art on the use of big data, big data generated by many actors in the data ecosystem, being from the banking sector, from the financial, from commercial, retail, from uh, telecommunications, and, and many other uh, actors in this uh, ecosystem. We also reviewed how um, academia and scientific research has progressed and uh, reviewed the latest innovations in statistical practices. Um, just to remind that the main blocks of the seminars, uh, there were basically two blocks. The first one was uh, revolving around the timely dissemination of short-term economic uh, information. And the second block um, of a more diverse and orthogonal point of view on special topics, which uh, we're doing uh, today. On the first block, we had the opportunity to learn mostly about the types of uh, big data that has been used for macroeconomic uh, forecasting uh, and uh, how different models are being used. You know? We also had uh, other conferences uh, that are relevant in terms of the health contingency that uh, has emerged in the during this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And these uh, conferences dealt with um, tracking economic activity uh, during the lockdown and uh, analyzing consumer mobility and consumer expenditure during the lockdown. Uh, today's session is going to be very interesting. We will move towards the second block on social and special topics on, with uh, two very interesting uh, lectures. One, uh, regarding about beauty and aesthetics and how to quantify beautiful places with uh, deep learning. So it's a very nice combination. And the second lecture about a global COVID-19 symptom survey, uh, a partnership with uh, Facebook. I would like to remind you that you can learn more about uh, this uh, series and about the the, 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 the vitae of the, our speakers in the website. I will thank you very much to the audience for being 
with us. In average, we have had more than 60 people that have connected to the series. And please, uh, I will leave it at there and let's uh, continue and give the floor to our important uh, lecturers today. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the um, invitation to come and speak and the, the kind introduction is, is, is lovely to be here. Um, let me just share my screen so that you can see my slides. All right. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so my name's Susie Moat. Um, I'm a professor of behavioral science at Warwick Business School, and I'm also a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Now, my background is a mixture of computer science and psychology. And for many years, people used to tell me that this was a really strange combination. But I'm not going to need to tell all of you today that increasingly everything we do is generating data. And so at Warwick Business School, um, I'm very honored to direct the data science lab with my colleague, Tobias Price. And in our data science lab, we're interested in data from the internet. So data on things people are searching for on Google, data on photos that people share online, data on online games that people play. And over the past few years, we've looked at whether we can predict human behavior with this data. We've looked at whether we can use this data to measure human behavior that was previously going to cost a lot of money or just a lot of time to capture. So for example, we've looked at generating rapid estimates of crowd size with mobile phone data and Twitter data. We've looked at generating estimates of how many people are traveling between different countries using data on photos that people share on social media. And we've also looked at whether we can improve estimates of how many people have certain diseases like the flu or dengue or chikungunya using data on what people are searching for on Google. But we've also asked ourselves, can we use data from the internet and perhaps a little bit of AI to measure things that we simply couldn't measure before? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So we were having a chat about the weather today in Mexico and the UK before. I have to say that um, here in the UK, we're not exactly known for having the best of weather, um, but, but partially thanks to our somewhat ghastly weather, and we do have some really beautiful locations here. So if you consider this photograph, this is a photo of the Lake District in the north of England. Now, I really love the Lake District. Um, I grew up near there and I used to really enjoy spending time there because being in this beautiful location would just make me feel better. Now, up there in the top right hand corner, that's Chinooki Sarasinha. So Chinooki recently finished her PhD in our data science lab. But before Chinooki became a researcher, she used to run her own design studio so she had a real sense for the possible impact of the way things look on how well we feel. So Chinooki, Tobias and I, we were looking at photos like this, and we were looking at the huge volumes of photographs that we now share online. And we were wondering, is there no way that we can tap into this data to finally get some sort of quantitative insight into the relationship between the way places look and how well we feel. Now, the, the cold reality of the situation is that even when we're not in the middle of a global pandemic, most of us unfortunately don't spend most of our time on holiday in, in beautiful places like the Lake District. So arguably the more important question is um, how the environments that we live in and the way that they look might relate to how well we feel. 
Now, thanks to the, the UK's Office for National Statistics, who we're delighted to collaborate with on a number of projects, we have great data here in the UK on how well people feel um, in relation to, to, to where they live. So we have a census every 10 years, and one of the questions on that census asks people to report on their health. So they can pick everything from very bad to very good. Now, unfortunately, we know, of course, older people tend to feel less healthy. You can see that in the data. There's also a bit of a gender imbalance as well. So men tend to report that they feel less healthy than women. And so we, we need to take that into account in relation to the local population before we can work with this data. But once we've done that, we can plot it. So you can see a map of the UK here. We're looking at England in this study. Um, and uh, darker areas are places where people felt healthier and lighter areas are, people where, are places where people reported they felt less healthy. And so you can see at a quick look um, some of the places that are major cities here in England, like London or Birmingham, are areas we see are lighter on this map. So people are reporting their health to be worse. So we've got data on how healthy people feel across England, but how could we get that sort of data on what the environment looks like at, at this sort of scale? So we were delighted that the answer to this question came to us in the shape of a game called Scenic or Not. So Scenic or Not is something that was made by an organisation called My Society back in 2009. And I'm very happy to say that, that Scenic or now, Not now lives in our, our data science lab at Warwick Business School. So Scenic or Not shows you photographs like this one and asks you to rate it depending on how scenic you think it is. So roughly how beautiful you think it is, although it is important what word we've given to the participants here. Sorry, Susie, so, your, your slides are still in the same one. Yeah. Oh. Can you move your slides on? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is that worked? Okay, so, all right, okay. Yeah. Um, good. So. So that doesn't, yes, okay. Yes, now we're seeing this the rest, yeah. Yeah, can you, is that now working? You can see the photo and you can see a map now? Yes, I, can, I think you can, you need uh, to put it forward. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe I'll try it. I'll try it like this then. Okay. So, um, so this is, this is Scenic or Not. Um, this is a website uh, that um, now lives in our, in our data science lab at Warwick Business School. Um, and um, Scenic or Not shows you photographs like this, and it asks you um, to rate them depending on how scenic you think they are. So if you think that this, uh, this picture is very scenic, um, then you can give it 10, or if you think it's not very scenic, then you can give it one, or you can choose something in between. Now, um, the photographs in turn, they come from um, a, a website called Geograph, where people get points for uploading um, photographs in as many kilometre squares of, um, of the UK as, as they can. And so on the back of Scenic or Not and Geograph, uh, we have now got over 1.5 million votes for over 200,000 locations. And so um, we can plot that data as well. And it, it looks like this. So, Dark areas are areas that people rated as more scenic. Um, lighter areas are places that people thought were less scenic. And so up in the north, you can see a dark purple patch. That's roughly speaking the, the, the Lake District and surroundings. And um, so basically lots of people agreeing with me, which was good to see. And um, down in the south, um, you can see um, towards the, the southwest, you can see Cornwall, a beautiful coastal area of, of the UK, scoring well as well. Um, but down in the southeast, you see a, a lighter splodge 
that's London. So London hasn't scored as well as the Lake District. We, we might have as expected as much. And so just given that you mentioned I was having some problems with my slides, I'm just going to go back to this health slide in case you couldn't see it before. So this is the, the health data. So lighter areas are areas where people reported their health to be worse and darker areas are places where people reported their health to be better. So you can see London is light here too. So what we wondered is what would happen if we put the scenic data and the health data together? And what we found is that people who live in areas that are rated as more scenic report their health to be better. However, if you've just been looking at those two maps, especially when I've just shown them to you right next to each other, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, is, is this not rather trivial? I mean, we've seen on both maps, the cities are scoring worse. You know, they're, they're not rated as a scenic and they're also not areas where people are reporting their health to be as good. So we wondered the same. And so for this reason, we split England into urban areas, suburban areas and rural areas. And what we found was that across each of these categories of areas, so even if we just looked at urban areas, this relationship still held. So it was still the case that people who lived in more scenic locations reported their health to be better. Now, even with that out of the way, you might think, well, yes, OK, but who's going to live in the more attractive areas of the city? It's probably going to be the people who've got more money to spend on where they live and probably also looking after their health. So again, we wondered this too, but thankfully we have lots of data on various socioeconomic measures. And so we put data relating to income in there and also other socioeconomic measures of, of, of deprivation. And what we found was that, yes, although unfortunately, um, income can be related um, to health, um, so that people with less income do generally tend to report their health to be worse. And um, this still wasn't enough to explain this relationship. A final thing we wondered, and you might have wondered too, looking at this photograph is that, well, you know, you might agree with me that the Lake District is, is very pretty, um, but you might also have noticed it's, um, it's indisputably also very green. So, you know, you could ask, have we not just found a really complicated way of measuring how green different places are? So again, we wondered this too, but thankfully we've been able to measure how green places are for much longer than we've been able to measure how scenic they are. So essentially you can take, use aerial photography. So you, you take a photograph of an area from above and then you can use that photographic data to try and identify green areas. And so people have done this in the past. Again, we can plot this. And um, if you look towards the north of England, um, you will see that indeed the Lake District is found to be very green, as we might have expected. Um, but if we put that next to the map of how scenic places are, you can see that these two measures are not exactly the same. So, for example, um, towards the east of um, England, you can spot some areas where uh, they are rated as quite green. Um, but they're not rated um, as so scenic. And so what we wondered was, well, um, which data sets do we need to best explain the differences in how healthy people feel? And so um, we built um, three models. So we built um, one model where we just used the data on how scenic places were, one model where we just used the data on how green places were and another where we put both data sets in. And in, in all three models, we also included these extra variables um, on a range of other socioeconomic metrics, so including income. And what we find is that there's very little evidence that we can afford to throw the data on the aesthetic appeal, the scenicness of locations, and um, out if we want to best explain how scenic, how, how healthy people feel in different locations. So on the y-axis here, what you've got is the probability of each of these three candidate models given the data. Um, so each of the three models being the best model of the three models. And so areas that are coloured just in green represent 
probability that we should think that the green space only model is the best model. And you can see hardly any of the space on these bars is colored just in green. In contrast, purple is the model where we, we just look at the scenic nurse data. We don't use the green space data. Um, and you can see that if you look at urban areas by this analysis, the model which just uses the scenic data um, actually appears um, to be the best for explaining these health outcomes. And across areas as a whole, we're seeing a lot of evidence for putting both of these measures into the, into the um, model. So how scenic a place is and how green it is. So we were really excited to um, have found what seemed to be some evidence that um, the way the, the way that places look might not um, just be a nice to have, it, it, it might be related to something as important to us as our health. But having said this, I should be really clear about a caveat um, here. Um, it's not the case that we can claim and um, that we have found a causal, a causal relationship here. We, we can't claim that we've demonstrated that living in a more scenic place is going to make you feel healthier. And um, to do this, we'd need to rule out a number of other explanations. We've made some progress towards this, as I've explained to you. We've looked at other things that I didn't cover here, like pollution. Um, but one thing, for example, we haven't been able to rule out yet is the possibility that people who feel healthier suddenly decide to move to a more scenic location. And so this, this sort of thing is um, something we're, we're still working on. But even if we were for a moment to assume that there were a causal relationship, we'd still have a lot of questions to answer. So for example, um, we'd want to know, well, why? Why might it be the case that living in a more scenic location was making people healthier? Was, could it be that um, people who live in a more scenic location are more likely uh, to do exercise and that makes them feel healthier? Or could it be that people who live in a more scenic location um, just feel happier because they're there and that's what's leading them to feel healthier. Now happiness is an interesting topic and um, it's something that has traditionally been just as challenging to measure really as, as how scenic a location is. Um, so you could, for example, run an experiment. You could ask people how happy they were before you asked them to go through a certain condition. You could ask them how happy they were afterwards. That would give you some data, but that's very resource intensive. And so you tend to only get data for a, a small number of people. Similarly, there's been some, some great work where people have run surveys for numbers of years and they've asked many people over and over again through the years and um, how happy they feel. But again, surveys are very resource intensive. And so generally these measurements have only been collected once a year. And so in both cases, we haven't really got the scale of data that we'd really need to um, ask people to, to ask the question, are people really happier when they're in more scenic environments? And so for this reason, we were delighted um, to uh, collaborate with George McCarran, um, who had created an app called Mappiness. So Mappiness is an app that pinged you a couple of times a day and asked you how happy you were feeling. And also ask you questions like who you're with or um, what you're doing right now. And on the back of Mappiness, we have over three years of data um, for over 15,000 people um, on how happy they were um, feeling. So we can look at this data um, and it tells us for example, looks like we all only have to wait um, one more day um, and things will start looking up for us. However, this is British data, so you can see um, many of my, uh, my co-inhabitants of, of the UK may not be in the best of moods today, um, but I'm hoping maybe it's the, the inverse for you um, in, in Mexico. But, but these basic patterns aside, we can use this data to ask this question we couldn't really ask before. Are people really happier in more attractive locations? And the answer is yes, they are. Even if we consider whether that location is a natural location, whether it's a green location, whether it's an urban, a rural or a suburban location, even taking that into account, 
we can see that being in a more scenic location tends to be associated with people reporting that they're happier. And the boost in happiness from moving from the least scenic location um, in England to the most scenic location, we can see um, is just perhaps a little more than we might expect from someone listening to music. Um, quite it, more than we would expect from sleeping, resting or, or relaxing, maybe a little less um, than what we'd expect from people talking, chatting, chatting or socialising. Um, we can actually see it's, it's somewhere close to the inverse of um, the, the fall in happiness that people report when they're travelling or commuting, which I guess reflects one of the few positives <laughs> Um, of the very, very strange few, few months that we've, we've all been um, living through. Now, you might also ask again, okay, this is for all of England, does it hold if we just look at the built up urban areas that many of us live in? And the answer is um, yes, yes it does. And again, there are many, many more variables um, in this uh, model than I could fit on the slides to do with weather and to do with who people were, um, were with. And when we see that, nevertheless, this, this effect still, still comes through. So we found a relationship with how healthy people felt and um, with how happy people reported themselves um, to be. And so we were delighted to tell um, some planners about our new findings. And they said, well, you know, that's, that's very interesting. But what makes a place more scenic? And as planners, they were often more interested in more urban areas. So we dug out our pile of hundreds of thousands of photographs um, and we scratched our heads a bit and we found the photographs that had got the highest rating in urban areas. And we went back to them and we said, well, uh, we've looked at a few examples and we think maybe maybe people like like bridges. And, and then we went home rather disappointed because obviously if you've done all of this quantitative work, you don't really want to be reduced to looking at a few examples and, and trying to make um, a conclusion like this. So we, we had to admit we were not really up to the task of going through 200,000 photographs and trying to work out why certain photographs had been rated as more scenic. But luckily, as timing would have it, as many of you might realise, um, there's been some great advances recently um, in uh, how well computers can understand uh, what we can, what, what's contained in photographs. So in particular, there's been advances with something called convolutional neural networks. And so what we decided we should do is that instead of putting, um, trying to look through all of these photographs ourselves, we could put them all in to a convolutional neural network called Places CNN. It was created by some researchers um, at MIT. And if you put a photograph like this into Places CNN, um, then it will give you some ratings of features um, that come out. So for example, it will tell you something about uh, the kind of location it thinks it is. So this photograph, for example, got high ratings for valley or lake. And it'll also tell you something about the kinds of scene attributes. So here there's a high rating um, for natural light. And there's over 300 of these features that come out. And so this was fantastic for us. We could put our 200,000 photographs in, get over 300 um, features for each coming out. And that finally gave us the data we needed to build a model to ask, okay, exactly which places are people generally finding more scenic? Now, the first results, um, I have to confess, were entirely surprising if you just looked at the, the headline results. So, for example, we found that, like me, people were rating places like lakes um, very highly. They, were, they loved valleys too, whereas in contrast, places that the CNN had thought were like industrial areas were not doing as well. Um, same for buildings um, that look like hospitals. So if you just look at these results, and there's many other features that go with them, you, you could get the impression, okay, this, this is pretty straightforward. The green and natural places are scoring well, the built up places are not scoring as well. But if you dig into the data in particular, if you look at the results for the built up urban areas that many of us live in, 
you start to see that the story isn't actually that simple. So for example, there you start to find that buildings with character, so such as cottages or castles, and um, they were actually boosting the score of a, of a scene, despite being built elements. Similarly, viaducts and aqueducts, so basically bridges, to my absolute relief, um, after our initial uh, problems with answering this question, it turns out people do like, like bridges after all. Um, but if we look at green and natural elements, we also see that the story there is not as straightforward as we might think it is. So it's not the case that all green space is equal. So for example, whereas we were seeing that trees were boosting the score of a scene, um, large areas of grass were not. And so this helps us start to understand why we might have seen these differences before between the data on um, how scenic places were and how green places were. And this matters because that green space data has been accessible for much longer. Um, and so for that reason, many policy briefings have focused on um, the benefits of, of, of green space. And whereas we're finding that maybe now that we have this possibility to get more nuanced measurements of things that we as humans can also see, um, there might be more to it than, than that. So we, we were delighted to finally crack this question, but again, with this interest in urban areas in particular, we couldn't help but feel, well, you know, geograph and, and scenic or not, it, it, it's great. We've got these millions of votes, these hundreds and thousands of locations. We, we didn't have that before. But if you look at urban areas, it is only one photograph for every kilometre squared. And that's not really as dense as we'd, as we'd like it to be, you know, we, is, um, we're, we're packed in, in in much more density than that. Um, and indeed, geograph itself has a lot more photographs than that per kilometre squared. It's, it was just the photos that were selected um, for scenic or not. So we thought, well, you know, if we had a CNN, as we did before, that can tell us what's in a photograph, can we not create one that could also tell us how scenic the photograph is, because we've got this data that we could try and train it on. And the answer is, yes, we can. So we took places CNN and we did something called transfer learning. So we told it, stop trying to work out what's in the photograph and start trying to understand which photographs get higher scenic scores. And so once we trained our CNN, we could generate maps like this. So this is a map of the um, a central part of, of, of London. And all of the dots are geograph photographs. So you can see way more than one per every kilometer squared. Um, and the colors represent the ratings that these photographs got from the CNN. So, so blue is um, photos that the CNN liked. Red is photos that it didn't like so much. So if you look at this map, one of the first things you'll see is the CNN has drawn blue dots all over the green spaces. So it does seem to like um, green spaces. And indeed, when we asked the CNN, OK, can you tell us what your top 5% locations are in London? It picked out um, places that Londoners love green, play, green places such as Hampstead Heath. But at the same time, within that top 5%, we found that in line with our previous analysis of the elements related to scenicness, there were built up locations coming through as well. So for example, we found that the CNN shows up Big Ben um, and also the Tower of London. So to summarise, across all of this work, we've been able to draw on deep learning and crowdsourcing to try and get data on something that has always been fairly obvious to us as humans, but has until now been extremely challenging to get data on at any sort of scale. And, and using this data, we can see that scenic places are not just green places, and we can also see that they're not just natural places. But perhaps most crucially, we find using this data that scenic places might not just be a nice to have, they uh, might be important for something as critical to all of us as our health and our happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.
uh, Susie, for your very interesting talk. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience, and but all, first of all, I, I would like to make some uh, question by myself. I have the privilege to to be the first uh, to ask the questions. And, and I can see that uh, your work takes advantage of mobile technologies, gamification, crowdsource, and deep learning to find path find out patterns of beauty in portrait places. Uh, your research stands that people who live in more scenic locations report better health and are happier. There is a clear correlation between natural places and beautiful ones. It is expected that people who live in a natural places without the stress may have healthier life. But in the case of urban, urban locations, it could happen uh, uh, that beautiful places and better health are both related with better policy makers and city, city uh, participation, uh, citizen participation, uh, sorry, uh, in public affairs. Uh, are you planning to incorporate in your exploratory model these kind of variables? Uh, that's, that's one question. Uh, another one is, uh, Environmental features like vegetation can be inferred from satellite images. Are you considering incorporating this kind of data in your analysis? And last one for, uh, for me is, have you considered to incorporate sentiment analysis from social networks to measure uh, happiness? Thank you. Thank you, no, thank you for the, those, those excellent questions. So I think the first question was noting the importance of um, pol good policy making um, and citizen participation in policy making uh, to secure beautiful environments and also um, good health. Um, so you're absolutely right that this must be something that varies across um, areas. It's certainly something like many other variables that we'd be really interested in putting into the model. I wouldn't immediately know where to get um, the best data um, on that from, but I, I'd certainly be I'd certainly be interested in, in, in hearing about any, any useful useful data sources. We do hope the other way around that um, these sorts of, of findings can feed into policy making, both in terms of the broad headline findings and also in terms of the data, because obviously looking at one picture, you can make an assessment. Um, as a, yourself as a person, you need to acknowledge it's subjective, um, but trying to get an overview of the beauty of lots of different places and how that might interact with your other policies is really hard without data. And so we hope that having this data will help us um, make better policies that, that, that lead to these better, better outcomes. The second question, if I understood correctly, but please correct me if not, was about data on vegetation. Um, if, if I did understand um, correctly, um, then we, uh, we have this data on, on green space um, in there, um, and we, we have worked with uh, different data on the different kinds of lands, that, that, that land types that, that you might find in a, in a country in the past. Um, if you, again, if you think the specific um, vegetation data um, that we should be considering that would go beyond simple um, green space, uh, then that would be very interesting, in particular finding, given the findings that we see that um, green space doesn't seem to be enough to explain this scenic um, variable. You know, for example, trees are leading to higher scores, whereas just plain areas of grass, grass are not. Um, your final question was about sentiment analysis um, on social media for measuring happiness. Um, it's something, as you can imagine, we do lots of work with data, um, online data, and so certainly a topic where we're interested in. Um, so far, we haven't we haven't felt that we've needed to do that because we've had enough overlap um, with the uh, happiness data we have from 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 Mappiness. But an outstanding question is, is clearly about how we could extend this work um, to other countries. Um, so one of the biggest problems there is getting enough uh, is, is getting enough photography from a human perspective. So things like Google Street View can, can, can help with, with this. 
Um, and once we've got the photography, uh, um, there is a chance that we could use some of the methods we've developed here to start to rate it and use crowdsourcing to improve our training data. Um, but so if we were to have that photography but not have happiness data, then yes, that would certainly be an interesting um, avenue for, for trying to look at this relationship in other locations. Thank you, thank you, uh, Susie. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Gerardo Leiva. Uh, is how closely related is reported health with objective health? Uh, another one from, from he is how can you know that the correlation between beauty of scenery and health is not spurious? Uh, and the last one is, uh, are you controlling for the other difference besides the beauties of the scenery to ensure that the statistical association is valid? Um, can I, so I, the, there was a question about objective health and, um, and let me answer the first question of this. The, the first question was about the relationship um, between uh, reported health and objective health. And objective health. This is a brilliant question. Uh, it's a question that I care about um, a lot. So it's, it is really important. The data we have here um, is data on how healthy people report themselves to be, um, simply because that was the easiest data for us to get at scale. Um, however, and, and one of the reasons we thought this was useful data is because there are um, there is known to be a good correlation between that measure and um, other objective measures of how healthy people are. Nevertheless, um, we are very keen to extend these analyses and um, to consider more objective measures of health, so the prevalence of certain diseases, um, visits to doctors, for, for example, and that's something that we're, we're looking um, at trying to do um, at the moment. And that, that would certainly strengthen the conclusions and would also help us um, better understand what any likely mechanisms might be um, behind this, this, this finding. The second question was also really important. So um, how do we know this is just not a spurious uh, correlation? So I suppose it would be a spurious correlation if really there was something else driving the relationship that we hadn't taken into account um, in, our, in our model. Um, and again, I did emphasize um, we are not claiming that we have found a causal relationship at this stage, as lovely as that would be, um, because, for example, we don't know that people who feel healthier don't move um, to, to more attractive locations. But so we have um, done what we can to try and rule out um, other possible explanations for our findings. Um, so, for example, I told you about looking at uh, whether people live in the city or the country, um, how green an area is, and various socioeconomic metrics. And we have data on pollution as well um, that we've put into the, in, into the model. Um, but but it, is, it is certainly a battle. And so I'm, I'm, I'm always interested to hear um, of other things that people feel that we should put into the, the, the model to, to check this. And so, so any, any specific suggestions, um, I, I'd, I'd be really keen to, to hear about that so we can try and strengthen the analysis or, or rule it out um, as, as you do as you do in science. Um, so the, the third question was about, um, I'm not sure I understood the third question fully, um, Elio, so I don't know if you might be able to tell me again what that was and so I can clarify it. Uh, it's, it's, it's about controlling uh, other uh, differences besides the beauties of the scenario to ensure that the statistical association is valid. It's, it's related with the um, with the spurious correlation, I think. Okay. Okay. So, so, so for example, so I suppose that comes. It is related to the spurious cor correlation, as you as you say, um, and which is a really important question. Um, so the. Key things that we've looked at there are, for example, green space, as I mentioned before, um, whether it's an urban, rural or suburban area. We also, because we have data on um, uh, land use, essentially, uh, we can look at is this a built up area or, or not? And we've, we've, put, we've put that into our models as well. So we, we've tried to check that it isn't another element of the environment that, that might be explaining um, this relationship. Um, but it's a question we continue to ask ourselves. So, so again, I'm always interested in feedback on this. Yes, thank you. Uh, from Bartel Braxma, 
Uh, do you happen to know which kind of people submit ratings and how selective or not the response, respondents are? Tourists, for example, could be more enthusiastic than residents. Yes, uh, that is a really great question. Um, so doubtless there are going to be individual differences in um, how attractive people perceive different places um, to be. Um, and certainly if we had a grasp on that, I'm sure we would be able to strengthen these models further. At the moment, we don't know um, a lot about the people who submit the, the, the ratings. It's people who responded to an online call um, to, to rate photographs. Um, and so that we don't have an awful lot of information uh, beyond that. And, and you see from the scores that come in, of course, it's not the case that, you know, a certain photo always gets five, for example. You, you see some spread um, and you see that, that some photos uh, have greater spread than others. So people are less likely to agree on certain photos than, than, than others. But at the same time, on the whole, looking through the data, um, see a uh, comforting uh, correlation, um, so clustering of, of votes for different photographs. So, so there is, we see a broad tendency, which um, you know you could, you could look at some example photographs in the in the papers to, to, to see how your preferences would ac accord with with the ratings in, in the data set. And um, we we do think we've captured um, at least broad preferences. Or, um, at least for the for, for the UK, and, and that this is a step forward beyond what we had before, because we simply did not have data on beauty um, at, at scale before. But definitely, again, a further step would be to refine that further with you know, information on where people were from, what kind of environment did they grow up in, do they actually live in the place they're rating, etc. Thank you, Susie. Uh, there are uh, some uh, comments between that uh, related with the uh, clear relation between health and environment. Uh, and I think that, that it's obvious that, 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 the, that those things are related, but maybe the, the great value of, of, of your work is that you are uh, showing these relations with data. Uh, and it's, it's something that, that is not the, just the relation, but the measure the measure of the of the relation uh, from Ricardo Gomez uh, is a question: uh, How are the results correlate with public services available in certain areas? Um, so that that would be another measure of the local in environment. So there's, I, 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 we may have covered that. In some, there's a chance, I think it's possible, it's possible that one of the variables we have in there would capture this um, to some extent for the health analysis um, at least, but I wouldn't want to make strong uh, comments on that with, without double, double checking this. So um, again, it's an, important, um, it's an important aspect, it's an important question about uh, the places people live. We do have this kind of range of metrics of socioeconomic uh, characteristics of the local area, um, which I think you might find if you looked at it would, 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 would cover um, a, lot of, a lot of this question, but it, it's a good point. Well, thank you. I, I, I may have another question related with the deep learning me method. Uh, uh, I think very difficult the, the task that you, are, you, you want to solve with deep learning because you, you want to, uh, that the machine uh, discovers beauty or can characterize beauty. And, and I think that beauty is a, a very subject, subjective uh, characteristics. Uh, you know, uh, there, there is no uh, clear criteria that, uh, that tells us what is beauty. Uh, do you think that really uh, a, a machine learning a methodology can uh, discover beauty in the in the things uh, as, 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 as people do? So, so you're absolutely right that it's subjective. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, it's not the case that if you get a group of 10 people and a set of photographs or locations that they're all going to react exactly in exactly the same way. 
But despite that subjectivity, um, we do see general tendencies in, in people's um, responses as, as a whole. Um, and so, and the data that we have collected by getting people to, to rate photographs, um, in the end reflects, when we put all the data together, reflects those general tendencies for the group of people um, who, who responded. Um, and so I, I think it is, with that data, it is then feasible um, to, get, uh, to get an algorithm to capture those general tendencies. And I think that then gets us further than not having um, any measure of this at all. Now, obviously then in, in, in interpreting that data and using that data, you, have, you do have to remember that, that this is a subjective measure and something else um, some further information you could extract from the data, as I was referring to before, is which areas do there tend to be less agreement on? What kinds of locations do there tend to be less, less agreement on? Um, could you then build something which would mimic one person's preferences? I think you probably could if you've got enough data from that one person, although they'd have to be willing to rate a lot of photographs um, so, that you could, so that you could capture that, that data. Um, and you could look to do that for different groups of, of, of people, um, so customising to local areas. I think with the right training data, it's apps, I do think it's feasible. Um, of course, then people might change their taste over time and, and, and then you need more data. So there are further complications. But I think, you know, if we don't let... In, in no way is this data perfect. It's, it's certainly not perfect, but I think those of us who, who, who work with data on, on humans and the world we live in, very rarely is, is data perfect. And so I guess the goal is, um, from our perspective, to find the, the value in the data and be careful about the limitations of, of the data. And so we think there is value here, both in the data and in the methodology, and that we can have quantitative measures um, of this construct um, at large scale, um, so that we can take this into account um, in, in policy making, at least have half an eye on it in a way that it might have been very difficult to do um, in, in, in the past. And we can also show that, for example, it seems to not just be, it doesn't seem to just matter that the place is green, but that it's aesthetically appealing, which is not just about it being, being green. And, and that can then inform decisions about um, things that we decide to build or things that, that, that we decide to destroy. And so for these reasons, we hope it's useful. Yes, yes, I agree. Uh, uh, finally, I, 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 I would like to ask you about, uh, I, I see in your CV that you are advisory of uh, policymakers. Uh, and I want to ask you, how open do you feel the policymakers are to incorporate this kind of results, this kind of uh, analysis to their uh, uh, policy uh, maker uh, activity. So, so I think there's a lot of interest in, at least from, from certain corners, um, in new data sources, in new methodology. Um, it is different data um, and different methodologies to what we had before. And so I think um, the imperfections can sometimes be uh, off-putting if you're used to a different set of imperfections. But again, I think that's more about everyone taking a step back and saying, well, none of this is perfect, but maybe we can get the good out of the different options that we now have. And so I, I think um, so we're, we're delighted. We've had a lot of interest um, in, in, this, in this work uh, from, from policymakers, from architects and, 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 and planners. Um, and so I think there's the, the certainly interest and um, appetite, uh, but it's obviously, I wouldn't wish to say that it was a small amount of, of, of work to, to get everything in place that, that's really necessary to support um, robust, uh, robust decision making for the public good. Well, uh, thank you very much, Susie. It's, it's been a pleasure to have your talk and your experience. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, this is the final comment for, for this 
uh, session and we invite to the audience to the following conference. And, and thank you very much, Susie. Thank you very much for the invitation. I've really enjoyed participating. Great. Thank you. So we're having the next uh, conference, so please join us. Thank you.